Okay, thank you, Patrick, for the kind introduction uh, and happy Bastille Day and happy Bastille Day to all of you um, in France. Um, so I think you're all looking, you should all be looking at um, uh, a VS Code window. Yeah, is, is that, uh, Rob, can you nod? Is the, the, I'm, I'm showing the screen. Yeah, good, okay. Um, so my, my task today is to talk to you about logic and Lean's mechanisms for handling the logical connectives. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna talk for a little while, I'll give you a quick overview, uh, and then we'll go back to the breakout rooms and, um, uh, and continue working through uh, Patrick's tutorial. Um, on, the, on the slides, I say that afterwards, we're gonna ask you to self-identify how far you got with the tutorials and so on. Ignore that, we've decided not to do that. Um, we'll, Rob will just shuffle the, the breakout rooms uh, randomly. Um, but as a logician, I feel like I need to start with a little bit uh, of an apology, uh, namely by pointing out that in this presentation, I won't tell you anything that you don't, in a sense, already know. So, uh, I mean, I'll say silly things that uh, like, you know, if you wanna prove A and B, it suffices to prove A and it suffices to prove B. Uh, it wants to prove A and then to prove B. Or if you know A and B, well, then you know A and you know B. Um, and when I do that, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I mean, I know you know that. Uh, but the point is that um, to communicate these intentions to lean, um, you know, we have to give names to these activities and, and you know, we need something to be able to type. Um, uh, so for example, you know, if, uh, if you wanna prove A and B, well, you might have a theorem in your library that says exactly that. Um, so, you know, maybe that's what you want to apply. But if, if you want to prove A and B by splitting it in parts and proving A and then proving B, you need a command that tells lean that's what you want to do. Um, and that's the split tactic. Um, and so it's those, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to be trying to convey. Um, so, you know, by way of analogy, I think, you know, learning the, 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 the logical uh, connectives and the rules that govern them, it's like learning um, grammar. Um, you know, you can be a perfectly competent speaker of a language without ever thinking about, you know, nouns and verbs and adverbs and subjects and predicates and tenses and so on. Um, but, you know, when you then learn the grammar, you're sort of making explicit the things that you know implicitly and giving, giving names to them. Um, now, in a sense, that's, that's not such a great analogy because we do teach school children grammar uh, in, the sen in, the, in the hopes that that will improve their writing uh, you know, their writing skills and make them better writers. Um, whereas, you know, by teaching you logic, I'm, I'm not going to make you a better mathematician, or at least I'm not, you know, it's not going to um, uh, let you prove anything that you could not prove before. Um, what it does is it gives you the means to, to formalize, to express it formally to the computer. Um, so in that sense, you know, interactive theorem proving, you just want to think of as a tool. It's a tool that lets us do mathematics um, uh, very precisely and communicate it very precisely. Um, and so in that sense, I like to compare it more to like learning uh, LaTeX. Uh, you know, nobody would, would claim that the essence of mathematics is in typesetting, uh, but typesetting is important. Communicating mathematics clearly is important. And so to do it well, you know, you need to recognize that sometimes you wanna display equations, sometimes you wanna emphasize things, and then you give those things names and you kind of learn the LaTeX commands to do it. You know, the, the syntax, the backslash, square brackets, uh, and so on. So that's really what you should think about what, we're, what, I'm, what I'm doing here. Um, so just about everything you know, uh, I'm talking about here is in the tutorial, a lot of it was in the, in the natural numbers game. So um, to a large extent, what I'll be saying will be review uh, for many of you. Um, everything is also in mathematics and lean in greater detail uh, with more examples and more variations. Uh, if you want a more logic-y foundational perspective on the logical connectives and how they work, uh, theorem proving in lean is a, is a good place to look. Uh, but also there's a, a very nice cheat sheet. So that's the, uh, the link that I have there. Uh, that really gives you a nice summary of, of the things I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, now. Uh, and all of these things, I think just about all of them you can find if you go to the uh, leanproovercommunity.github.io page um, and you, you know, click on uh, learn to lean and, or learn under that leaning resources, learning resources, uh, you'll find uh, all of these things here. Uh, moreover, this, this file itself is in the, in the LFTCM repository. Um, and I should say that most of the examples I'm gonna use here are taken from Mathematics and Lean. 
Um, oh, I should also say, feel free to um, interrupt. So I'm not, I don't have a, another Zoom window open, so I'm not looking at chat or anything. So if there's anything that I can clarify along the way, um, probably the easiest thing to do is just, just unmute yourself and speak up. Or if you put something in the chat, you know, maybe Rob or Kevin or somebody will, uh, will be bolder. We'll, we'll watch the chat for you. Don't yeah, okay, good, okay. Um, Okay, so here's a, a quick overview of the logical connectives. Uh, so I've got, you know, the, uh, a few columns. So on the left column, there's the symbol, you know, the, the, the way you express it to lean. Uh, I have the, uh, the uh, um, sum of the VS Code, uh, uh, you know, keyboard equivalents, how you type them in. The ordinary language uh, translations, and then kind of the pretentious, you know, Latin-based logicians description of the, of the connective. So there's, you know, the arrow, which, you know, you can write with backslash two or backslash r, which represents if then, and it's called implication. And similarly, the universal quantifier, the existential quantifier, uh, negation, a conjunction, a by application, disjunction. So for all exists, not, and if and only if, or, and then false uh, and true. And to think about what, what the rules do for you, it, it's helpful to keep in mind that lean goals uh, have a form that looks something like this. So when you're in VS Code, you know, working on a lean proof, you know, the, 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 the system might tell you you have one goal and it looks like this. And you've got a list of objects and a list of hypotheses, and then this funny turnstile symbol, um, and then a conclusion. So the stuff before the turnstile symbol is called the context, or sometimes the local context. And the things in the context that aren't data, so the hypotheses, like the statement that X is prime and so on, are called hypotheses, or the local hypotheses. Uh, the thing after the turnstile is sometimes called the goal, or the target. And it's a little bit confusing because sometimes when people use the word for um, uh, the word goal, they mean the whole thing, you know, the context and the conclusion. Uh, and sometimes they just mean the conclusion part. So, you know, bear with me. But usually when I use the word in the goal, uh, when, the word goal in this tutorial, I'll be talking about, you know, this, this, this part here, the, the target. Okay. And a common theme for the rules in Lean, and something to be mindful of, is that, you know, when we talk about the uh, uh, working with an expression where the primary connective or the outermost connective is something or other, there are usually two kinds of rules that, that go with it. So some tactics tell us how to prove a goal based on the connective. So how to prove an and or prove a for all or prove an if then. Um, and these are called, uh, you know, logicians will call those introduction rules. They tell us how to introduce the connective, how to prove something with, with that connective. Um, and then some tactics tell us how to use a hypothesis that involves the connective. So in other words, if you have a hypothesis that's an and or a for all or an exists and so on, there are tactics that say, here's how you use it. Here's how you, you know, make use of it to, to prove your goal. And once again, I've got a summary, but this is very similar to what you'll see on the, um, uh, on the cheat sheet. So I've got, again, I've got the symbols and the, you know, the, the, the natural language descriptions. But the first column are the introduction, you know, the tactics that are used for introduction to, to prove things. And the things in the last column are the elimination or the, ta the, you know, the, 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 the tactics you, you employ to use the connectives. So for example, to prove an if then, you use intro or intros uh, if you wanna you know, chain them, uh, do more than one at a time. Uh, if you have an implication in your, among your hypotheses and you wanna use it, you can either apply it to the goal or with the have statement, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example. You, um, uh, so if H1 is an implication, uh, H1 followed by H2 means apply H1 to H2. So that's how you use it. Uh, similarly, universal quantifier, you know, you can, you can introduce or apply a specialize. Um, and so I'm not gonna, you know, run through them all. Um, I'll say a few things about them now, but we'll, we'll do some examples and you'll play with them. But for the existential quantifier, um, to, to, to prove an existential statement, you basically tell, tell Lean what you wanna use to witness the existential quantifier. And to split it apart, you use cases. Um, Cases, uh, we'll see, is really a kind of a Swiss army knife of tactics. You'll see that it's used with exists, it's used with and, it's used with if and only if, it's used with disjunction. It's really a general tactic for taking apart information and it, it remarkably it just does all the right thing in, in the different cases. Um, I'll go back and yeah, I'll say more about things later, so let me not dwell on them. Um, 
let's see, there was something I wanted to say. What was it? I don't know. Okay. Um, um, so yeah, so, so this, this list is here. Okay. Uh, oh, and also if you want to do proof by contradiction, that's, that's something that's important. There's a by contradiction tactic you need to use. Uh, and to use that, you have to tell Lean that uh, you want to use classical logic. And so there's a way to do that, that, uh, um, that, you know, we'll, we'll come across later. Um, okay. Uh, so one, that's, that's one thing that there are different rules to introduce connectives and then to use them. Uh, the other common theme is that uh, lean will unfold definitions, and sometimes the logical structure is 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 hidden under a definition, but uh, uh, but you can force lean to unfold that for you um, automatically. So, for example, saying that x divides y is uh, is uh, well, x divides y is defined to mean that there is a z such that x is equal to y times z. So that's an existential existential statement. There exists a z. And so when you have that in a hypothesis and you use cases, you know, that will get lean to unfold the definition and, and, uh, and treat that as an existential statement. Similarly, S uh, is a subset of T, if S and T are sets, um, it's the statement that every X in S is in T. And so that's a for all, it's a for all X. And so if you do an intro, if you say intro X, um, that will get lean to unfold this and leave you the goal uh, uh, that's showing that if X is in S, then X is in T. So um, I'm not going to go through all the connectives, but I'll go through um, some of the main ones and just give you some quick examples. And then, you know, you can go back to the tutorial. Um, and again, you've, you've been doing some of these things all along, but now you're at least more aware of, of what it is that you've been doing. Okay. Um, so let's talk about implication and the universal quantifier first. Um, uh, again, that you've been doing all along. Um, so the interesting thing about implication and the universal quantifier is that they are grouped together which is to say that in Lean's foundational framework, they're treated in very much the same way. So if you look at the theorem you know, in the library, add, le, add, so let's sort of un unpack it here. So, um, um, so this is a very generic theorem. It'll work for, um, uh, it'll work on, uh, on, you know, on the integers, on the rationals, on the natural numbers, uh, uh, on the real, so on all our number systems, uh, but also, you know, general algebraic structures that have an ordering um, that kind of respect the, uh, uh, that, well, and in addition, that respects the ordering. So what this says is for any type alpha that happens to be an ordered, additive, commutative monoid, for crying out loud, um, um, if A, B, C, and D are in alpha, and A is less than or equal to B, and C is less than or equal to D, then A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D. Okay, um, so, so some things to talk about. So first of all, uh, tomorrow's sessions, you'll learn more about algebraic structures and you know, these type classes and what they mean and how to use them, so let's not worry about it now. Uh, the squiggly braces, the curly braces around A, B, C, and D uh, indicate that these arguments are implicit, uh, which means that typically we don't have to type them. You can kind of, well, you have to leave them out. Lean expects the first argument to be rather um, a proof or the hypothesis that A is less than or equal to B. Okay. And the reason that they're left implicit is that typically when you use this theorem, it's in a context when you're applying it to uh, um, some hypotheses or you're applying it to um, a goal and from you know, the hypotheses and, or from the goal, you can figure out or lean can figure out what A, B, C, and D are. Um, so because- Jeremy, you, know, you, have, you have a question in the chat. What does the at symbol mean when you use it? Yeah, so let me, uh, I, I will come back to that okay. in just a second. Yep, okay. So, um, so typically you want to leave those uh, implicit um, and only give those arguments. And what the at symbol does is exactly undo that annotation of making things um, implicit. When you put the at symbol, that says make everything explicit. Um, so when I take off the at symbol, right, it's lean is sort of trying to guess what all the arguments are. And because it can't guess, it's kind of leaving these funny placeholders. So these scary things with the question marks are called meta variables. It indicates that lean, you know, tried to fill them in and couldn't. Um, and when you use the check command, putting the at symbol says, don't make anything implicit, display all the arguments. So that's just a little trick there. So, but uh, the at symbol is used explicit, well, exactly when you want to give implicit arguments explicitly. 
Okay, so for example, here I want to give it uh, um, A and B. So the first two arguments, uh, the type and the fact that, uh, so let's see, so A, B, C, D are all real numbers. And in this case, if I give lean A and B, it can figure out that the type is the real numbers and it knows that the reals are an ordered additive commutative monoid. So in this expression, I've, uh, I've written add le add. I've, the underscores mean leave these arguments implicit. You're explicitly leaving them implicit. So lean will fill them in, but I give it A and B. And you see the resulting theorem is uh, uh, for every C and D, if A is less than or equal to B and C is less than or equal to D, then A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D. Right. And you can play this game. If I apply C, then I'm left with for all D, if A is less than or equal to B and C is less than or equal to D. And if I go on and continue to apply that to D, right, we're left with the remainder. And now if I apply this to the hypothesis that A is less than or equal to B, so I've called that H1, then you get that. And finally, if I apply it to H2, you know, you get that A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D. Okay, so this is applying a, uni a statement with universal quantifiers and, uh, and implications successively to the data, A, B, C, that you want to use it with, A, B, C, and D, and then the hypotheses. Um, oh, and I should have said, uh, I guess some of you have guessed this, but when you see an iterated sequence of arrows, A less than or equal to B, C less than or equal to D, you know, plus A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D, the thing to keep in mind is that here the parentheses are implicitly associated to the right, which means you should read this as saying that if A is less than or equal to B, then if C is less than or equal to D, then A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D. And the reason we adopt that convention for reading the arrows is exactly that it's useful in this context where you want to apply it to A, then B, then C, then D, then a hypothesis, then another hypothesis. Okay. Uh, okay, um, so let's just give an example. Um, oh, one more fact that which may have come up. Jeremy, there's yes. another question. Yep. Um, what are the first two implicit variables here? Um, so let's see. So these, uh, so I think you're asking about uh, the first two, the type alpha um, and the fact that it's an ordered additive commutative monoid. Okay, so as I said, add this theorem that if A is less than or equal to B and C is less than or equal to D, then A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D. Um, it's a very generic, very general theorem in the library and it applies to lots of algebraic structures. So the first two arguments are the type that you want to apply it to and the algebraic structure. And as I said, you'll learn more about that tomorrow. So don't, don't worry about it. You can think of it as just kind of a generic, uh, well, it's just, it's just something in the library right now that you can use. Um, but yeah, that's what it means. So typically you don't have to tell Lean what type your objects are because you know, when you give it the objects, A, B, C, and D, it knows that they're real numbers. Okay. Um, so that's, that's why that information is generally left implicit. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so let's just do an example. So, um, uh, so let's sort of do it uh, a few different ways. So, um, so we have add le add as an implication. So one thing we can do is, you know, apply add le add. Okay. And that leaves us, uh, you know, the first goal, which is H1. So we can say apply H1 um, and uh, apply H2. Okay. And then we're done. Okay. Um, but another thing that we can do is, uh, uh, let's kind of play around a little bit, is um, I can take add le add, apply it to H1. Um, and then apply that to the goal. So remember, this was the theorem that said uh, 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 for every saying that for, well, there it is. Uh, so this is the theorem that's saying for any unspecified objects now, uh, M1 and M2, if M1 is less than or equal to M2, then A plus M1 is less than or equal to B plus M2. So in other words, I've applied the theorem to one hypothesis, H1, but I've left 
uh, I've, uh, I've left out some information. But now when I apply that to the goal, I get C less than or equal to D, right, which I can then finish off with apply H2. Okay. Um, another thing you can do is I can, instead of doing that, I can, you know, create a new hypothesis H3. I can say H3 is add, LE add, and I'll apply to H1, right? So now you get this funny display that you've got, you know, H3 is this funny goal with, uh, with uh, you know, Lean could not figure out what, uh, what uh, C and D, you know, what these two arguments in the theorem were. So that's why it's, you know, these goals are uh, two real numbers are still unspecified. But now you can apply H3. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then apply H1, sorry, H2, and we're done, okay. Or, you know, another thing is I can just, uh, you know, reason forward entirely in this hypothesis. So now H3 is, is the theorem A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D, right? And that solves my goal exactly. And I guess another thing worth mentioning um, while I'm here is that if you have an assumption that solves your goal exactly, you can just use the assumption tactic. Okay, so that's, um, that's just uh, some examples of apply. Um, so let's just do one more along those lines. Um, so this is uh, taken from Mathematics and Lean. So if you have a function f from the reals to the reals and a real number a, um, so saying that a is an upper bound on f, or f has upper bound a, just says that for every x, f of x is less than or equal to a. Okay. And so now let's try to just prove this theorem um, that if a is an upper bound on f and b is an upper bound on g, then a plus b is an upper bound on the function that maps x to f of x plus g of x. So I think, I wasn't here this morning, but I think uh, Patrick talked about lambda abstraction. Uh, but in any case, this is just a name. So the lambda notation means that this is a name for the function that maps x to f of x plus g of x. Okay, so let's try to prove it. So this is one of those examples where, um, you know, the, the, the quantifiers are buried under a definition. So looking here, we see that we have the functions f and g, we have a and b. We have the hypotheses that A is an upper bound on F and B is an upper bound on G, and there's the conclusion. I think there are two ends now, right? I'm sorry, there. The, the theorem is ended twice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, okay. And uh, so, what yeah, do we want to do? I think this was yes. a section end of actually. Was it a section end? Removed. Okay. So, so the, the, there is no uh, duplicated end. There, there is ah. no because the proof is not complete. Yeah. yeah. So what? Yeah. That's right. That's right. That, yeah. So the the squiggly line is telling me that the proof is not over. So it's you know telling me that the that the proof is incompleted. And uh, to structure this document, I have a sec. I put this data in a section uh, in between section and end. And what that does is when I declare these variables f, g, a, and b, um, they're only in scope within this section. So this theorem refers to those variables, but outside I can review, I can reuse f, g, a, and b for something else. So that's what that's what the section end does. Oh, and we can we can um, you can name a section, and then Lean wants you to give the ending the corresponding name. So again, this is another good way to kind of structure a long proof and a long theory document to sort of break it into, into sections. Okay, coming back to this. So our goal is to show that A plus B is an upper bound on you know, F plus G. And now we have to remember that, uh, that this is a universal statement. It's the same that for every X, F of, well, for every X, F of X plus G of X is less than A plus B. So the command to, to, to prove a universal quantifier or to prove a universal statement is uh, to introduce X. So you wanna say let X be arbitrary. And now we have this unfortunate situation that we're taking the function that maps X to F of X plus G of X and applying it to X. Now this should really just be F of X plus G of X. Um, it doesn't hurt Lean to leave it like that. Lean will kind of contract this when it has to. 
but there's a command called uh, dsimp. It does definitional simplification um, that does exactly things like that. It will kind of simplify um, the expression. Okay, so we introduced x. X is arbitrary. Now we're, uh, we want to show that f of x plus g of x is less than or equal to a plus b. Uh, so now what do we do? Well, so now we have to remember that we have some hypotheses that are, are universal, right? This says for every x, uh, f of x is less than or equal to a. And so it's kind of clear that we want to specialize this hypothesis at x, right? So one way to do it is to use the specialized tactic. That's a specialized, uh, that assumption at x. Um, and there it is. This became f of x is less than or equal to a. So instead of saying that for every, everything, for every x, f of x is less than or equal to a, it's now, uh, it's true of that particular x. Okay, so specialize is one tactic you can use to, to, to instantiate a universal quantifier. Um, another thing you can do is use a have, as I did before. So you can do have, uh, so we haven't used H yet. So H, B, H, G, B applied to X. So here I've taken the hypothesis that B is an upper bound on G and I, I've specialized that to X. So these two do similar things. The difference is that specialize um, got, so replaced the first hypothesis with a specialized version. Uh, the have statement leaves the original one there, but then gives you the particular instance. So that's a good thing to use, for example, if you want to use this hypothesis more than once. Okay, but now we know what to do. We can just apply add, le add. Okay, and uh, uh, well, let me just say assumption. Assumption for now. Okay, so that's an example of uh, uh, using universal quantifiers. Okay. Um, okay, let's talk about the, the existential quantifier. Um, so if you want to prove an existential statement, what you need to do is tell uh, Lean what you want to use um, to witness the existential quantifier. So here I'm asked for a, a, a real number between two and three. So here I'm gonna tell Lean to use oops, five halves. And Lean just does exactly the right thing. It says, okay, I'm saying that, look, there is a real number between two and three, namely five halves. And Lean says, okay, prove to me that five halves is between two and three. Okay. And happily, we can use the norm num tactic to do that. Uh, so that's something that, that Rob will talk about um, uh, in a session later today. Okay. So that tells you how to prove an existential statement. Um, the next thing you want to do is the next question is, well, what if you want to use an existential statement? Okay, so to illustrate that, so one way to do, there are lots of ways to do it. One nice way to do it is using the cases tactic. So let me give you an example of that. So remember, we've already defined the predicate uh, Fn ub to say that a is an upper bound on f. So now let me define a new predicate so the function has an upper bound. So saying that f has an upper bound just says that there's some a such that a is an upper bound for f. Okay. So this theorem is asking us to prove, well, let, me, let me set up the context, that uh, if uh, f is bounded and g is bounded, so if they're both upper bounded, then uh, the function which maps uh, 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 x to f of x, well, the function f plus g has an upper bound. Okay, so if f and g have upper bounds and f plus g has an upper bound. So this is an existential statement. It's an exist statement. So to prove this, we have to give an upper bound on f plus g. But right now we can't possibly give an upper bound on f plus g because we just don't have any data, right? There's nothing in the context that could possibly serve as an upper bound. On the other hand, um, we know that f has an upper bound. So we want to reason about that one and we want to reason about the upper bound for g and use those to construct the upper bound for f plus g. So the tactic that says take an existential statement and you know, give me the thing that's, assert that's asserted to exist um, is called cases. That's what cases will do. And so I'm going to use cases ubf and um, I'm going to name the data so I want to give it a name for the, the thing that's asserted to exist. 
So let me call it A. And then the property of A, I'm just going to call HA. So in, in Lean, we often use H for hypothesis. And so HA is just the hypothesis on A. And um, so what you see is what the cases did was it unpacked the fact that F is bounded and gave us an A. Uh, and the hypothesis that A is the effort bound on F. And similarly, I'm going to do cases U, B, G with B, uh, H, B. And we get the property that, um, uh, that B is an upper bound on G. But now we have the data. We have an A, we have a B. An A is an upper bound on F and B is an upper bound on G. So A plus B should be the upper bound on F plus G. So now we tell Lean to use A plus B. Um, and now we're in good shape. We want to show that we have that A is an upper bound on F, B is an upper bound on G. We want that A plus B is an upper bound on F plus G. And in fact, that's the theorem that we just proved up here. And I had the foresight to, to name it FNUBAD um, because now having done that, we can just apply it. Yeah, and we have the hypothesis as well, HA and HB. Okay, so that's it. So that's uh, the existential quantifier. This is a very common pattern, by the way. Uh, you know, when you prove a theme, you often have hypotheses with existential content, and then you know, and then you assert something to exist in the conclusion, and you typically you know unpack the data from the hypotheses using something like cases, and then you put it together and you then give it to the conclusion with the use tactic or something like that. Okay, uh, let's talk about negation. Oh, this is what I wanted to say before. Uh, in Lean, uh, negation is defined to be implies falsehood. Okay, so saying that F doesn't have an upper bound, so not F, you know, not Fn has upper bound F, uh, is uh, is defined to be saying that uh, the assumption that Fn, that F has an upper bound uh, implies false, implies a contradiction. Uh, and the, the, the reason that's useful to know is that tells you that the rules for dealing with negation are very similar or the same as the rules for dealing with implication. Right? So for example, to prove that F doesn't have an upper bound, I want to assume that it does. And to assume that it does, I use intro. Okay, oh, let's, let's, let's see. Uh, let's call it H prime, I guess. Okay. Or even let's give it a name. Let's call it UBF. Right. So mathematically we're saying, uh, well, assume F has an upper bound. And let's show that that leads to a contradiction. And so, so now we have to think about what's going on. So H says that for you know, every real number, there's an X such that F of X is bigger than A. Uh, and that you know, sounds like it should contradict the fact that F has an upper bound. So from these two, we should somehow be able to get to falsity. But now you have to think about how to do it. Uh, but now you think, and now you remember, oh, but this is, this is an existential, you know, this is an existential statement, saying that it has an upper bound, says that there is an upper bound. And so we can, we can name it, we can, we can, uh, Pack it, unpack it, and I don't know for variation. Instead of calling it A, let me call it B for bound. Right, so let me call it. Let me say cases. Uh, uh, what was it called? Oh, so cases. Oops, cases U B F uh, with B H B. Um, okay, and there we have. Uh, now we have a bound B, and the fact that B is a bound on F. Um, Okay, well, we're still looking for a, uh, uh, a contradiction. So uh, uh, where's the contradiction? Um, well, let's kind of reason on. Uh, well, so we have that bound as a B on F, but now that should contradict the fact that we have something, well, for every A, we have something bigger than it. In particular, the first hypothesis tells us that we should have something bigger than B. Okay, so let's specialize that. Specialize uh, H at B. Okay, so now we're making progress. On the one hand, we have that B is an upper bound on F, but on the other hand, we know that there's something bigger than B. Okay, what to do next? Well, this is really a universal statement. Um, you know, we can use it when we have something good to apply it to. Uh, but here, this existential statement um, uh, is, is helpful. We should just unpack it. 
so we know that there's something bigger, there's some x as f of x is bigger than b. So let's just name it. And for variation, um, let's just call it y. Oh, so cases, sorry, what was it? It was uh, uh, hb. Uh, no, no, cases h, sorry. There we go. Um, so it's, you know, it's useful to, to remember that you can name your variables anything you want. And so let's see, where are we now? Uh, so we know that we have a y such that f of y is bigger than b. Um, oh, but that should contradict the fact that b is an upper bound on f. Uh, well, saying that b is an upper bound on f says that, uh, you know, b is uh, 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 bigger than, greater than or equal to f of y for every y. So again, we want to specialize hb. So let's do that. Specialize hb at y. Oh, and that looks like a contradiction. Okay, so we have that f of y is greater than b, and f of y is less than or equal to b. And happily, there is a tactic called linearith uh, that does linear arithmetic and just draws out that contradiction there. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't understand the first line. So you introduce UBF. So I read that as let UBF be arbitrary, but it knows what it is. Yeah. Yeah, good. So um, what you should remember is that this negation is equivalent to, oops, implies false. Yeah. Is equivalent to that. Um, and so the other thing to remember is that intro will work for a universal quantifier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let X be arbitrary. It also works for an implication. Oh, I see. If you want to prove A implies B, you assume A and then you derive B. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it, it's a it's a funny artifact of Lean's logic that that the universal quantifier and implication are 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 act are are really instances of the same thing. They're treated the same way, and so in this case, the intro is to introduce a hypothesis, introduce the assumption. You want to show if this holds, then you can drive a contradiction. So you say assume this holds, and what changes is after this line, you have this assumption and you're trying to prove a contradiction. I also have a question. In the morning, Patrick mentioned something called the delta conversion. It's like things just follow from unfolding definitions. Exactly. Here, everything that we prove, are everything that we prove here just the delta conversions? Uh, exactly, that's exactly what's going on. So when, um, so when I use the negation, when I give Lean the intro tactic, Lean looks at this conclusion and says, what am I introducing? This isn't an implication. It's not a universal quantifier. I don't know what to do. Let me try unfolding um, the, 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 the negation. Okay, so that forces Lean to unfold it. And uh, again, it happens here when I have uh, H, no, let's see, uh, where was it? Here. HB is this uh, definition. It's implicitly a universal quantifier. When I tell Lean to use the specialized tactic, Lean struggles to make sense of it and interpret that as a universal quantifier. And to do that, it, it, it unfolds the definition of FNUB, which was right there. So the de definition is in terms of universal quantifier. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's exactly definitional expansion or definitional reduction. And uh, yeah. Maybe let me add to that, uh, that it's not only delta reductions that's going on. I mean, yeah. do, doing this cases, we're really doing something. We cannot just say, hey, Lean, just do delta reductions all the way and be done with the proof. Yes. So, for, sorry. So the, 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 the definitional reductions we use to unfold the, uh, the knot and unfold the definition. Um, the intro is a logical rule. The cases is, is a logical rule. So you're, you are moving data around. Um, and, uh, and then when you apply a previous theorem, you know, that's using something for the library. So yeah, it's not, it's not just unfolding definitions. Um, but, that's, uh, but that's certainly an important part of it. Nice. Thank you. Excuse me, okay. can I also ask one question Sure. about the third line? So on the third line, you specialize H to B, yep. right? And, and uh -huh. now in the fourth line, you do cases H. So it means that 
uh, remembered that H is, uh, it will always be specialized to B. Once yes. you specialize, it, it okay. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So every tactic has its own personality and its own quirks. What specialized does is it takes the hypothesis you give it, it, it instantiates it, and it throws away the old one and use, retains the name for the new one. And is there a so, way to give a new name? So, so if instead you want to introduce a new hypothesis, which is the old one specialized at B, is it possible? In case you later, oh, okay. No, that doesn't work. Right. Oh, I should mention, no, uh, here's another that's good That's exactly trip. the half statement. Yeah, that's I'll do the half statement, yeah. Except the half statement keeps the, the, whole, the old one around. Ah, yeah. Right. So I should, oh, then, uh, uh, yeah. right. Yeah. So I should. Uh, yeah. So I should point out that uh, um, uh, the documentation is pretty good. So if you hover over a tactic, you know, you get you get an explanation of, of what it does and it's often variations. Um, so yeah. So you can say have uh, h prime uh, equals uh, what was it? Oh, was h applied to b? Is that it? No. What did I was applying to? Uh, what was there before? Yeah. That's that's it. Oh, have uh, uh, H prime, H applied to B. But why is my case is broken now? Because, uh, because you H prime. Oh, it's H prime, it's casing H prime, yeah, sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can, uh, I mean, other funny things you can do. You can, um, uh, you can use the same name. Then you have this unfortunate situation that you have two H's uh, and Lean uses the, the later one, it, it shadows, okay. Um, uh, but you can also do, uh, there's also a tactic that will, uh, Oh, let me fix that. There's another tactic that will, if you want to throw away the old H, then manually you can clear H. Yeah, so what specialized does is it basically instantiates, it basically does this and throws away and renames. It does this funny thing. Um, but yeah, so that's just, it's just what the specialized tactic does. Okay. Um, okay, so I do I'm, want, I'm not actually sure if I'm the session chair here or if Patrick is, but I just want to let you know, Jeremy, you've been going about 45 minutes. Uh, okay. Um, let me, yeah, so let me skip. Uh, so I do want to, yeah, give you time to, 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 to mess around with things. Let me skip then the uh, conjunction um, and let me just do one more example using the disjunction, just another example of, uh, uh, of cases. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so uh, if you look at the theorem, uh, so here, uh, so the theorem we want to show is that uh, x is, if x is less than the absolute value of y, then it's either less than y or less than negative y. And I want to do this uh, by, uh, first of all, using the fact that for every y, either zero is less than or equal to y or zero is greater than y. And then we have, there's another theorem in the library. It's really just comes from the definition of the absolute value that says if uh, A is uh, 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 non-negative, then the absolute value of A is A. And if A is negative, then the absolute value of A is negative A. Okay. So the way you split on a conjunction, so basically I wanna say, look, to prove this theorem, I wanna split on the two cases. Um, and this is another place where the cases tactic works. So if I say less than or greater than zero Y, uh, oh, Ellie or greater than zero Y. Good. Uh, and you see, uh, it's a proof by cases. Lean does exactly what you would expect. It says, okay, there's, uh, there are two cases. Um, in the first case, uh, zero is less than or equal to Y. And the second one, zero is greater than Y. And it's even, uh, uh, Lean is even uh, kind enough to, to, to mark uh, this as saying, this is the left case, uh, and this is the right case of the disjunction. Um, and I should also mention that with cases, again, you can you can name the hypotheses. So Lean chose H for these, but you can make them sort of more informative. So I can say with, I don't know, Y non-neg and Y neg, Y non-neg and Y neg. Okay. And so in the first case, I have the fact that Y is non-negative and the second that it's negative. Okay. So now let's just take each one in turn. So in the case where Y is non-negative, I want to use this to rewrite absolute value, get rid of the absolute value. Um, so let's see. So in this case, I want to uh, use rewrite with apps of non-neg y non-neg. 
okay? And so, uh, so now we're trying to show that if X is, so it, it changed the absolute value Y to Y. So now we're just trying to prove that if X is less than Y, then either it's less than Y or it's less than negative Y. And so let's intro H now. Uh, and so to prove a disjunction, right, what we want to do is we want to prove, we want to, to prove the left disjunct. Okay, and the command to do that, the tactic to do that is simply left. Okay, I'm saying that, look, I want to prove this disjunction by, by going to the left one. So I say left and apply H. Okay, uh, and now similarly on the right side. So, so we want to rewrite abs of neg and do right, oh sorry, intro H, right and apply H. Uh, what happened? Why am I not done? You haven't uh, used the assumption Y neg. Oh yeah, apply. On the, uh, on the first line. Right, yes, the yes, thank you. No, first line. Ah. There we go, we're happy. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is a common pattern, again, with disjunctions. Very often you're trying to prove a conclusion that's either explicitly or implicitly disjunctive, um, but which case holds will depend on something in the hypotheses. So often the way the pattern goes is, you know, you split on some cases, uh, either, you know, in a hypothesis or something that you just know. Uh, and then in, in each corresponding case, you go for the, the corresponding disjunct. Um, uh, one more comment. So here the curly braces are used to structure the proof. Um, so the uh, uh, there. So what I've done here is I've I've used uh, curly braces to mark each sub goal. Um, so a, a, a style of, of of proving that I learned from Georges Gontier um, is that in fact it's kind of nice. I pre I prefer that when you get to the last case to go back to uh, to non indenting. Um, because if you think about it, if you've got a long proof and you've got lots of cases, you know, you'll start creeping across to the left. Um, and so, you know, I, I prefer to use the style that, you know, when you're splitting on cases, you put the first case uh, uh, in, you know, curly brackets to indicate that you're doing sort of a subcase or sub part of the proof. But then as soon as you're back to one goal, you know, you go back to, to, to not indenting. So the, the philosophy there is that, you know, mathematical proof reads best when it's kind of linear. So you really want there to be just one goal to focus on at a time. And every once in a while you have to, you know, handle some side cases. Okay. Um, uh, uh, but then when you're done, you know, just go back to the mainstream. So similarly with a proof by induction, um, I prefer to do the, in, the base case, you know, in curly brackets. But once you're done with the base case, then you're back to the, the, inductive, the inductive step, then go back to, um, uh, go back to the, uh, uh, you know, non-indenting. Um, so anyhow, both styles are, are, are used in, in the MathLib library and both are, are, are accepted. So you can, you can sort of decide, settle on your, uh, on your, your preferred style of writing proofs. Uh, so finally, let me just say that, uh, you know, I haven't done everything. There, there's more in the tutorial. There's more in Mathematics and Lean. Um, there are a lot of variations on these commands, but the ones I've listed above will, will really get you pretty far. So go back to the tutorial play around with them um, and uh, enjoy.